a very good morning to each and every one of you, especially if you are visiting with us for the very first time today. And what you'll find in front of your chair is there's a connection card, and we kindly ask you just to fill in your details in that connection card. If you're in the front row, it's on the uh, side of your chair. And we'd just like to be in contact with you during the week, just to give you a bit more information about Access Church. And on the back of that card, there's also a prayer request uh, section where whatever prayer request you have, however small, however big that may be, we'd also like you to fill that in and we would like to just uh, uh, cover you in prayer. We have a group of intercessors that are consistently praying for people and so we ask you to please fill that in and later on during our time of giving, you can drop that in the offering basket. Well, this morning we're going to continue with our series called Five Stones as we move on to part four. And so I just wonder if we can just bow our heads and let's just close our eyes. Let's just commit this time to God. And Father, we come to you today in your mighty and powerful name, Lord. And even as we approach your word today, Lord, we approach your word with open hearts, uh, with attentive ears, Lord. And we have come, Lord, to, uh, Lord, be carriers, Lord, of your word as well, Lord. Uh, Lord, may we not just be hearers of your word, but may we also be doers of your word. And so we thank you that your word is already anointed. We thank you that your word brings truth to our life, that your word brings correction to our lives as well, Lord. And so even as we sit under your word today, Lord, we thank you that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, Lord. So we even thank you that even today it will bring illumination to those dark places in our lives, Lord. And so we just bless you and we just commit this time to you, Lord. And even as I would minister your word today, I pray, Lord, that you'd hide my face so that only yours can be seen. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Well, maybe you're visiting with us for the first time and maybe you've missed uh, just the last three sessions of the series. So I want to start this morning, as I always do when we're doing a, uh, a, a series, is by way of a recap. Uh, now, as we've been saying, as believers in Christ, we are all part of the army of God. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you are part of the army of God. You are a soldier in the army of the Lord. Amen. Now, as a soldier in the army of God, we have been enlisted to fulfill an assignment. We have been enlisted to fulfill a mission and the mission that God has given us is called the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, from verse 18 to 20, Jesus says to us, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Remember, during the fall of man, that authority that God the Father had given us, Satan had stolen that authority. Because, but because of what Jesus had done on the cross, he had regained the authority. He had taken back the keys and so this is what he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so Jesus deploys his army. He sends us as the army of God out on a mission. But as we've been saying all armies will have to face adversaries. And as we advance God's kingdom, as we take enemy territory, as we possess the land, the one thing we need to understand is that there will be some obstacles, there will be some roadblocks, there will be some adversaries, there will be some obstructions that will come our way. Has anyone ever had some obstacles that they, would ha they had to face in their life? I'm sure there are many of us here who've had some obstacles, some roadblocks, some persecution, some challenges that we've had to face. There will be some giants that we will have to take down in life's journey. And we've been saying that the nation of Israel knew all too well what it meant to face giants. And one of those battles which we've been speaking about was that between David and Goliath, found in 1 Samuel from verse 17 uh, sorry, 1 cham uh, Samuel chapter 17 from verse 1 to 50. And many people would be familiar with the story of David and Goliath, even if you didn't uh, attend Sunday school or if you've never come from a church background. 
It's a very, very popular story, and it's the ultimate underdog story. The story of how a young shepherd boy named David was able to defeat a giant who was over nine feet tall with a stone, a slingshot, and unwavering faith in God. That was all that he needed. All he needed was one stone to take down Goliath, but we know from the story that David chose five stones from a nearby stream. And when we read 2 Samuel 21 from verse 15 to 22 in part one of the series, we found out that Goliath was not the only giant that David would have to face in his life. But there were four other brothers or relatives that Goliath had that King David and his army would later on have to face as well. And while David may not have killed those other four giants with a stone and a slingshot, those five stones that David chose that day from a stream, they were symbolic that for every giant that David would have to face in his life, that God had already provided a stone. He had already provided a weapon to take down those giants. And in the same way, we said that God has given us five stones. He has given us five spiritual weapons that we are able to use to take down any giant that can come our way. And in this series, we've been exploring these five stones or these five spiritual weapons that can take down any spiritual giant. And just as a stone needs to be placed in a sling in order to be propelled or projected, the stones or the weapons that God has given us need to come out of our mouths if they are to be effective. As Proverbs 18.21 tells us, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. And so when we speak, our words have power. That is what we need to understand. And God himself, in the very beginning, he spoke things into existence just by the power of his word. And so words have tremendous power. The first stone or the first weapon that we covered in part one of the series was this weapon of prayer. And we said that while prayer may have, may have many, many functions in our life, one of the functions it can be used for, it can be used as a weapon. In Ephesians 6, the Apostle Paul instructs us to put on the full armor of God. But one of the other things that he instructs us to do is to use our weapon of prayer. And so we have been given the powerful weapon of prayer. The second stone or the second weapon that we looked at was pleading the blood of Jesus. And we read in Revelation 12 verse 11, where it says, And they overcame him, speak, speaking of Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. And we know that Satan is not our friend. Satan is our adversary. And one of the things that Satan uses against us is he uses accusations against us. And that is why he's referred to as the accuser of the brethren. The Bible says that he accuses us day and night before God. And we know that there are ongoing accusations that come against us. But based on what we read in Revelation 12 verse 11, there is power in the blood of Jesus to overcome Satan, to conquer him, to triumph over him. And when he comes against us with all of his accusations, we plead the blood of Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus. We overcome him and, accuse, and his accusations by pleading the blood of Jesus and be, by declaring what Jesus has done for us. By declaring what Jesus has done for us. We said while the term pleading the blood might sound like it's begging, it is not begging at all. Pleading the blood of Jesus is actually a legal term and it's the same way a lawyer pleads his case before a judge. And so we can plead the blood of Jesus as well. Last week we looked at the third stone or the third weapon that we have been given and that is the powerful weapon of praise. And we looked at that story of Paul and Silas who praised their way out of a bad situation. At midnight, an inconvenient time, in prison, an inconvenient place, after being beaten by rods and having their feet fastened in stocks, not only did they decide to pray, they also decided to praise. Praise in such a way where the other prisoners could hear them. And because of their praise, the prison doors were opened 
and their chains were loosed. And so we've covered prayer, we've covered pleading the blood of Jesus, we've covered the powerful weapon of praise, but this morning we move on to the fourth stone or the fourth weapon that God has given us, and it's called proclamation. Proclamation. And the word proclaim, according to the dictionary, means to announce publicly or to say something emphatically. To announce publicly or to say something emphatically. The word proclamation comes from the Latin word proc proc uh, proclamari, which means to shout forth, to shout forth. And so when you are proclaiming something, you are basically shouting forth that thing. I like how the late Bible teacher Derek Prince defined proclamation. He said this, proclamation is, as it were, confession made aggressive. Proclamation is, in a sense, a word of spiritual warfare. It's releasing the authority of God's word into a situation, into our own lives, into the life of the church, into a political situation, whatever it may be. There are countless different situations that need the power of God released into them. And there is no more effective way than to release the power of God into a situation whether it's your own life, your family, your church, your nation, whatever it may be, then proclamation. Proclaiming is really the activity of a herald. A herald is a word we don't use very much today, but a herald was a person with authority from a king or a duke or some nobleman who went to a particular area concerned and he made a proclamation of the will and the decision of the ruler in that particular place. And so that is how Derek Prince speaks about proclamation. There's an authority that comes when we begin to proclaim a certain thing. Now there are three things that God has given us that we need to proclaim. Three key things. Number one, we can proclaim the name of Jesus. Number two, we can proclaim the word of God. And number three, we can proclaim the word of our testimony. The name of Jesus, the word of God, and the word of our testimony. And so this morning we are going to be looking at these three things. Let's start this morning by looking at the name of Jesus. And it's something we've been singing about this morning. So can you turn with me, if you have your Bible, to Mark 16 from verse 15 to 18. If you don't have your Bible with you, you can follow on the screen above. Mark 16 from verse 15 to 18 says this and then he told them go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned these miraculous signs will accompany those who believe they will cast out demons in my name and they will speak in new languages or new tongues. They will be able to handle snakes with safety, and if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick, and they will be healed. And this is just another version of the Great Commission. And you see, not only does Jesus give us a mission, a commission, or an assignment, but he also gives us the authority to accomplish this assignment and that authority comes in the name of Jesus. The authority we have to accomplish the mission or the assignment that Jesus has given us comes through his name. The name of Jesus gives us authority to accomplish God's purposes. The name of Jesus is our power of attorney. Listen to what Jesus tells us in John 16 from verse 23 to 24. He says this, At that time, you won't need to ask me for anything. I tell you the truth, you will ask the Father directly and He will grant your request because you use my name. You haven't done this before. Ask using my name and you will receive and you will have abundant joy. It's the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Philippians 2 from verse 9 to 11 tells us that the name of Jesus is the name above every other name. There is no name like the name of Jesus. It says this, 
Therefore God has exalted him, speaking of Jesus, to the highest place and given him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What a powerful name, the name of Jesus. I remember growing up, we used to sing the song, In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, demons will have to flee. I don't know if anyone remembers that, that hymn. Such a powerful hymn, declaring what the name of Jesus can do. In Luke 17, we find Jesus sending the 72 of his followers out and giving them an assignment. And when they return to him, they give him this, this wonderful report. Luke 17, reading from verse 17 to 19, this is what it says. It says, The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. You see, what we need to understand is that there is power in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is not just any name, but there is an authority, there is a power that comes when we use the name of Jesus. And whenever the enemy comes against us, we can use the authority of the name of Jesus against him. The whole weight of heaven backs the name of Jesus. You see, we don't just call on the name of Jesus for salvation, but we can proclaim the name of Jesus as a weapon of deliverance against our enemies. It is the name of Jesus. In 1 Samuel 17, 45, as David is approaching Goliath, I want you to take note of what David says. 1 Samuel 17, 45, he says this, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. You see, not only did, did David have his slingshot and have faith, but he had the name of Jesus. He had the name of God, the name of God Almighty. And so that is the first thing that we need to proclaim. Whenever we are faced with any giant, any obstacle that may come our way, any demon in hell that comes our way, we have the name of Jesus. The second thing that we can proclaim is we can proclaim the word of God. And let's go to Ephesians 6 and we're going to be reading from verse 10 to 17. Ephesians 6 from verse 10 to 17 says this, Finally be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore put on the full armor of God that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. See, God has given us a sword. When we look at the armor of God, most of those are protective, defensive weapons. But then there's the sword. The sword, this powerful, offensive weapon that we can use against the enemy. Now, there are two Greek words for word. One is logos and the other is rhema. And in this instance, the word of God being referred to is not the word logos, but it's the rhema word. It means the spoken word, the proclaimed word of God. When we begin to speak, when we begin to proclaim the word of God, that is when that word becomes a weapon. 
And when you begin to proclaim the word of God, it becomes a powerful weapon against the enemy's attack. Let's turn this morning to Matthew 4 and see how Jesus himself proclaimed God's word as a weapon against the enemy. Reading from verse 1 to 11 of Matthew chapter 4, it says this, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. How many of you have ever been tempted in your life? And temptation is something that we will all face in this life. But let's note how Jesus responds to this. It says, After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him, Satan himself came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord God to your test. Sometimes... The enemy can even use try and twist and confuse scripture against us as well. It goes on to say, Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. What did Jesus himself use? What's the only thing he used? He used the word of God. The word of God, he proclaimed the word of God as a powerful weapon against the enemy's attack. And one of the things that the enemy wants to attack is he wants to attack identity. Notice in the portion of scripture we read how twice Satan says, if you are the Son of God, questioning Jesus' identity. And very often what Satan will do is he will bring either who God is or who you are into question. He will either bring God's identity or your identity into question. We see this when Adam and Eve are tested or tempted in the Garden of Eden. He begins to, to question the identity of God, to make them doubt in God's goodness, almost like God is withholding something from them. And then here we find that even in the wilderness, Satan himself is beginning to even question the identity of Jesus himself. Jesus himself. But there's one thing we need to know is that the Word of God reveals identity. It never confuses and it never distorts identity. And what Satan has done and what he is continuing to do is he is trying to confuse identity, distort identity. He's trying to distort the identity of God, but he's also trying to distort our identity. And whenever the identity thief, Satan, identity thief, Satan himself, tries to attack you, we need to come against him using the word of God. What does God wor God's word say about God himself? That God is a good God. What does the word of God say about yourself? It says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That you are the head and not the tail. That you are above and not beneath that no weapon formed against you will prosper. We need to lay hold of the word of God. So, we can proclaim the name of Jesus, we can proclaim the word of God, but the third thing that we can proclaim is that we can proclaim the word of our testimony. Which sometimes I think we don't realize the power of our testimony. Now in Acts 1 verse 8, I want you to take note of what it says. Acts 1 verse 8. It says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
You see, in Acts 1 verse 8, it says that the Holy Spirit comes upon us to empower us to be witnesses. Now, what does a witness do? A witness testifies. You see, in law, a witness is someone who either as a volunteer or under compulsion provides testimonial evidence, either spoken or written, of what they know or what they claim to know. You see, when it says that we are a witness, it's actually a legal term. A lot of the language in the Bible is, 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 is legal language. And so a witness gives testimony. And so if God has empowered us to be witnesses, He has empowered us to give our, our testimony. Revelation 12, 11 says this, they, they triumphed over Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. So we have a testimony. And sometimes we say to ourselves, you know what, I don't really have a testimony. But each and every one of us has a testimony. We have a testimony of what God has done in our lives. And sometimes we, we're scared. It's like, I don't really have anything to say. And if you have never shared your testimony before, or if you don't know how to share your testimony, here are five things you need to know concerning your testimony. I'm going to give you five key things. Number one, your testimony should be comprised of three parts. Three parts. If ever you want to share your testimony with someone, it should be comprised of three key parts. In your testimony, you should briefly describe your life before Christ. What was your life like before Christ? Secondly, you should carefully explain how you came to the point of surrendering your life to Christ. How did that happen? And for some people, it was a moment in time. They can tell you the exact date, the exact time that they gave their lives to Jesus. For others like myself, it was a process. But you need to describe what really happened. How did you come to that point of surrendering your life to Jesus? And then thirdly, you need to joyfully describe your life since accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. What are the changes? What has God done for you? So, Describe what was your life before Christ, how did you come to Christ, and what is life like now that you've received uh, Christ into your life. So, your testimony should be comprised of three parts. Secondly, your testimony must be truthful. In a court of law, a witness must tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So when you share your testimony, you don't need to lie or exaggerate. And some people do that for dramatic effect but you just need to be authentic what this world is looking for is they lo are looking for authenticity they are looking for people who are real who are just willing to share very openly what God has done for them so be truthful in your testimony be honest the third thing is that your testimony must be tactful so number one, it must be comprised of three parts. Secondly, it must be truthful. Thirdly, it must be tactful. You need to show skill and sensitivity in dealing with others or with difficult issues. Sharing your testimony is about glorifying God. It's not about attacking any other faith or religion. It's about lifting up the name of Jesus. You don't need to attack anyone or wh what they've done or where they come from. All you need to do in your testimony is to lift up the name of Jesus. I see so many people attacking other people. All we have to do is lift up the name of Jesus. Ephesians 4.15 tells us that we are to speak the truth in love. And when you share your testimony, let there be love in your testimony. You can speak the truth, but you can also do it in a loving way. In a loving way. The fourth thing about your testimony is that your testimony must be thankful must be thankful. You should express gratitude for God, to God for what He has done in your life. So often in our testimony, we glorify more what the devil did than what God has done. Your testimony is about being thankful and glorifying God and telling the world, this is what Jesus has done for me. So it should be comprised of three parts. It should be truthful, it should be tactful, it should be thankful. And then the other thing we need to know about our testimony is that our testimony will allow us to
to take enemy territory. That's the power of our testimony. In John 4, we find the story of the Samaritan woman. And the Samaritan woman has a radical encounter with Jesus at a well. She's going, going to draw well, uh, water from this well, and there she encounters Jesus. She has this radical encounter, and after this, it's, the Bible says that she goes back into her town, and she begins to share her testimony with other people from that town. And in verse 39 to 41 of John f uh, chapter 4, this is what the Bible tells us. John 4 from verse 39 to 41, it says this, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. Do you see the power of this woman's testimony? How it's allowed enemy territory, the area of Samaria, to receive the gospel. And so that is what we need to understand is that our testimony can be so powerful. And so often we can come, become just, the enemy tries to keep us silent, but we need to become bold. Remember Acts 1 verse 8, but you will receive power. Sharing your testimony cannot be done in your own strength. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to empower you, to give you the boldness to share your testimony. But being a witness is not just about what you say. It's about who you are. A witness is something you are, not something you do. And so that is what we also need to understand. It's not just what you say, because you can say something and live completely different. And so God has given us this weapon. It's this weapon of proclamation, where we can open our mouths and whenever the enemy comes against us, whenever any obstacle comes against us, whenever the full force of hell comes against us, we know that we have the full backing of heaven. Number one, when we proclaim the name of Jesus. Number two, when we proclaim the word of God. And number three, when we proclaim the word of our testimony. All of these three things release God's authority over every situation that we may find ourselves. And so what about you this morning? Have you been using this weapon? Very often we know about the weapon of prayer. We know about the blood of Jesus. We know about praise. But how often do we just open our mouths and begin to proclaim? Proclaim the name that is above every other name. Proclaim the word of God. The thing is you can't proclaim the word of God if you're not spending time in God's word if you don't know the very verses and the very scriptures that are found in his word. But the other thing you can proclaim is we all have a story, we all have a testimony. I was so blessed yesterday, sitting at the back and hearing five testimonies. The ladies sharing their, their stories of how they were able to rise above certain situations. And you have a testimony. And when you begin to share your testimony with others, that opens the door for us to begin to take enemy territory. And so that is my challenge to you this morning. Won't you open your mouth and won't you, won't you begin to proclaim? Won't you begin to use that weapon that God has given?